this computer. Okay. And um, the first speaker on the set, uh, the first paper on the session is going to be symmetry breaking with your hands tied. And Yannick Maus is going to be presenting the talk. Yannick is on you now. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the introduction. Yep. So this is joint work with Magnus uh, from Reykjavik and with Fabian from Freiburg. And the actual name of the paper is actually distance to coloring in the congestion model. So uh, oh, we do the standard, sorry. standard st yes. So we do the standard congest models. So we have a communication network. The nodes can uh, exchange small messages in synchronous rounds. So messages of size order of log n bits. And you, they can only send messages to the immediate distance one neighbors. And at the end of the algorithm, each node has to announce its color. So, and complexity measure as standard is just the number of synchronous rounds. So what we want to look at here is distance two coloring. So as opposed to the standard distance one coloring. So at the end of the protocol of the algorithm, uh, the vertices have to output a color such that distance two neighbors. So any vertex in distance at most two have dif different colors. So an equivalent notion of this is that we want to actually have a distance one coloring of the square graph, like the square graph G squared, where G is the communication network. So note if G is a communication network, then vertices cannot even know who are their distance to neighbors in the congest model. And just as standard for coloring, we want to, the number of colors that we want to have here is the maximum degree of the graph plus one. So this is delta squared plus one if delta is the maximum degree of G. So note that this question or this problem is not really interesting in the local model because you can, just simulate a distance one coloring algorithm or it's not more interesting than distance one coloring and uh, yeah i don't want to say too much now why we should study this problem just give a few pointers it's also why we're maybe in this session it's important for wireless networking because if you have interference between vertices with a common neighbor but it can also be used for derandomization uh, so instead let's rather look a bit at yeah, what is this problem? What can I say about this problem? So first of all, verifying that some given coloring is a valid distance to coloring is very easy in the congest model. You just let each node send its color to its immediate neighbors. And then just if a node receives the same color twice, it's an invalid coloring, otherwise it's valid. In stark contrast, learning the colors of any two neighbors is very hard because you have many of these, you have delta squared, but because all communication has to go through this communication network uh, G, you can uh, only hear about delta of them at a time. So it takes a long time. So yeah, let's look at our results. Our results are three different algorithms. The first one is a randomized algorithm, which colors with delta squared plus one colors in order of log n times log delta time. The second one is, the, or the other two are deterministic. The second one takes yeah, a constant fraction more colors and has poly log n runtime. And the last one takes has delta squared plus one colors and the runtime, which is polynomial and delta. So there's no, there, no previous work, as far as I know, on distance two coloring in the congest model. But there's quite a bit of work or a bit of work uh, in distance one coloring. I won't go into detail of this previous work. Instead, I want to use the rest of the talk to say, like summarize our main technical contribution. And this is this first randomized algorithm, which is yeah, rather involved and try to summarize this algorithm in one line. And for this, we will first look at this uh, previous work here, a very simple log n round randomized algorithm, which yeah, it appears in a few papers, but I think it's also just folklore. So this very basic randomized algorithm, in this algorithm, each node that's uncolored just picks an available color. So an available color is the color which is currently not used by any of the already colored neighbors. If no neighbor also tries the same color, then you keep using it and uh, yeah, otherwise you update the set of available colors and try again. It's well known that this is an order of log and round algorithm. But this is for distance one coloring and it doesn't work for distance two coloring because the step of updating your available colors this is something which we cannot do efficiently here. So which colors should we try here? 
if you're uncolored, because you cannot learn your set of label colors. So to summarize what we do in one line is, well, we do coloring with the help of friends. So already colored nodes try to help the uncolored ones to get colored, and they act as a filter to suggest good color tries for the uncolored neighbors. So in the longer talk and in the paper, you can find more about who helps whom to get colored, how do the nodes filter, how do we get around congestion, yeah, and a bit more about why we should study this problem in the first place, also about the deterministic algorithms. And I guess that's it for the short talk here. And happy to hear questions. Okay, any questions? Uh, I have a question. If uh, uh, So I, I'm sorry, maybe I missed the, uh, I don't know if you said it at the beginning, but do you need, uh, uh, for your randomized algorithms, do you need uh, node IDs, unique IDs? Uh, we assume them, but no, you can just flip unique IDs, right? With high, the, the algorithm is just correct with high probability. So you okay, can just- Okay, so do you need a knowledge of N? Uh, I think yes, yes. Yes, I see. Okay. Like we have several places where we use this. Yes. I think it's much harder if you don't know N. Yes. It should be. Uh, other questions? Yes. What other problems will be interesting in this setting? I guess, I mean, MIS is more or less the same, but I mean, yes. I mean, uh, would the spanning tree make any sense in distance too, or something not uh, the same? We have, there's another uh, paper when one of the courses here at POTC about optimization problems, vertex cover and dominating set. I, uh, this is interesting, and uh, I think it's in general interesting to uh, investigate this setting where you have some problem with in congest with some communication network in congest and the problem that you want to solve is not defined on the communication network itself but rather on something which is in close relation to the communication network but because uh, in the local model we use this a lot in reductions to solve problems and we always define these virtual graphs and you solve for example an mis on this virtual graph and uh, in congest, it's much more unclear, in particular in deterministic congest, I guess, uh, how to do these things. So I think there are more, a lot, quite a few things to explore here, but it's not clear for which problems you can have interesting results, I think. Some um, become trivial, like MIS. Yeah. Um, okay, so. Um, there is one question in the chat, and I'll repeat it to you, Yannick. But if you can stop okay. sharing your screen, I will um, yes. allow the next speaker to stop sharing. I hope I can do that quickly. And I can read the. Yes. Um, so, Philip. Um, Yuval, do you share this? Allow them to, like, specifically to share the screen, each person, or. No, oh, he's I there. Right. So. Okay, uh, and Yannick, the question on the chat was asking, what about using Pyceridum Pemaraju? What about using a palette of size two times the neighborhood plus one? Yes. Magnus already kind of answered it, but I don't yes, know if he answered it. It's, yeah. it's very interesting. Also for list coloring, it's very interesting where we also cannot get these results yet. So this is, and it seems to be harder. So, okay. yes. And also maybe randomized, one more thing, randomized, it, if you use a constant factor more than these delta squared colors, it, the problem is much easier. So really here in this paper, it was really hard to get down to this delta squared plus one. So if you use two times delta squared, it's very easy. Okay. All right, so thanks, Yannick. I think we move to the next talk. Um, okay. And that's gonna be on efficient deterministic distributed coloring with small bandwidth. And Philip Bumberger, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, is going to be presenting the talk. Okay, thank you. So this is John Ford, Fabian Kuhn, and Yannick Maus. The global and the congest model. Uh, Philip, just, just one second. If you could make your video like of yourself also available, that would be helpful for the talk. If uh, not, it's okay. 
I, it is it is available, yeah, right? Is. Oh, I can't see him. Then it's me here. It's my Zoom. Sorry, my fault. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Best model are two classic synchronous message passing models with difference that messages in the local model can be of unlimited size, whereas in the congest model, messages are restricted to all flock and bits. The graph problem we are considering uh, is the delta plus one coloring problem. For this problem, we know the following upper bounds expressed as a function of the number of nodes. For the local and the congest model, all of log n randomized algorithms are known for more than 30 years. Recently, also the existence of a deterministic local algorithm for coloring was proven. However, for the congest model, the best known deterministic algorithm is almost exponentially slower. And as the main result in, of our paper, we give a deterministic polylogarithmic congest algorithm, closing the exponential gap between the randomized and deterministic complexity of delta plus one coloring in congest. As the main building block, we use an efficient algorithm for network decomposition. So far, this structure was particularly interesting for the local model, because given a network decomposition with, parameter, uh, with diameter D and Z colors, one can solve delta plus one coloring, and in fact, many other distributed graph problems, in time O of C times D by iterating through the color classes and computing a coloring on clusters of the same color in parallel. In the local model, any graph problem can be solved trivially in diameter time by collecting the whole graph topology at one node, solving the problem locally, and uh, broadcasting the solution. At this year's talk, Rojan and Gafari presented an algorithm for network decomposition with diameter polylog n using polylog n colors and taking polylog n rounds for the, in the congest model. By the above claim, this proved the existence of a polylogarithmic local algorithm for delta plus one coloring. However, it is not obvious how one can exploit a small diameter in congest. As our main result, we proved that also in congest, one can compute a coloring in essentially diameter time with a polylogarithmic overhead, proving that the delta plus one coloring problem can be solved deterministically in polylogarithmic time in the congest model. Our algorithm is constructed as follows. We use a de-randomization strategy where we start with a zero round randomized algorithm that makes good progress in expectation and apply the method of conditional expectation to deterministically fix a random seed that gives a good progress. So the most natural randomized algorithm would be to assign each node a tentative color from its list uniformly at random. We define a random variable x v for each node v, which equals the number of conflicts of v. That is the number of neighbors that shows the same color. We can show that the sum of these values, a random variable that we call x, is smaller than n in expectation. For this property to hold, only the color choices of adjacent nodes need to be independent. And therefore, we can reduce the number of independent random bits we use to O of log delta. We introduce a random variable r for each random bit and use the method of conditional expectation to successively fix these bits such that finally, when all bits are fixed, and hence tentative colors for the nodes are chosen, the sum of all conflicts is at most n. Sorry. This means that at least half of the nodes have at most one neighbor with the same color. So at least a quarter of the nodes can keep their color permanently. Hence, after log n iterations of this process, all nodes are colored. However, the obstacle for implementing this procedure efficiently in the congest model is that for computing the conditional expectations, Nodes need to know the color list of the neighbors, and exchanging color lists is too costly in congest. The idea to circumvent this obstacle is to slow down the color choice. Each color consists of a bit string of length log c, where c is the size of the color space. We define a zero round randomized algorithm to choose a single color bit and a potential function, which measures, measures the progress of the bit choice. 
We then apply the method of conditional expectation to fix a random seed that yields only a small increase in the potential. This can be done in O of diameter contest rounds. After lock C phases, when all bits are fixed and therefore each node has chosen a tentative color, the potential equals the number of color conflicts and is upper bounded by 2n. It follows that at least half of the nodes have at most four conflicts with the neighbors, which is sufficient to permanently color a constant fraction of the nodes. For the whole coloring process, we therefore obtain the following runtime. To de-randomize a single bit of the random seed, we need diameter time. The seed has length log delta, so for fixing one color bit, we need diameter times log delta rounds. The colors consist of log C bits, so we need to multiply with log C to obtain the time for coloring each node tentatively. As we have seen, a constant fraction of the nodes can keep their color permanently after this process. So we need log n iterations of this process to permanently color all nodes. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Philip. Um, great talk. Questions? So I have a question. So I'm, I'm so you're passing one bit at a time and kind of broadcasting to the whole network. Is that correct? Or to the neighborhood, at least? I mean, that part, I, it was a short talk, so I didn't get it perfectly. Yeah. So you do one um, bit at a time, I get it, but how do you pass it to all the other nodes is my question. Um, I guess you do not actually, actually pass the chosen bit to all nodes. It's just um, that you have a randomized algorithm that chooses one bit. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, you have this, this potential function that measures the, the goodness of this bit choice. Uh -huh. and, um, yeah, the aim is to, to find a random seed, to use this method of additional expectation to find a random seed. Um, yeah, such that this, this random seed, um, um, yeah, with this, this random seed uh, defines a certain bit for each, for each node, for a mm -hmm. certain color bit. Um, yeah, and such that the, the potential does not increase by much. Yeah, but then so, the nodes, Okay, go ahead. Um, no, I think the nodes do not uh, exchange the color bits. But they need to receive this color bit from the seed. So it's like a broadcast that gives each node its color bit. That's the part that I don't understand. And maybe it's just because I really didn't understand because I, there was not enough details here, but. Um, Okay, what, what the nodes exchange is all the information they need to um, compute the um, conditional expectation, mm -hmm. uh, the expectation of the increase of the potential uh, conditioned on some part of the random seed. And this information, this is what I did not, uh, did not mention, is um, this can be um, exchanged in congest, and this is just the, the size of the color list, and yeah, some, some other information that I haven't mentioned here. Um, and then the nodes, we do an aggregation over a BFS mm -hmm. tree in the, in the graph, and we aggregate the condition expectation of, of this potential, um, yeah, condition on some part of the random seed. But there's no need for the nodes to ex other, okay, they, they, they do exchange the color bits after each round. Yeah, this is true. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, there's a broadcast or something like that that you're doing. Not exactly a broadcast, but yeah, I mean, just after after each round, uh, after after each phase, there's just one additional round where each node uh, exchanges to its neighbors the bit it has chosen. Okay. This is just uh, one round uh, in addition after each, uh, yeah, after each round of the derandomization. Okay. All right. Other questions? So. Well, we can continue the discussion on Zulip um, if people have questions later on. But maybe also in the sake of time, maybe we'll move to the next speaker here. Um, Philip, if you can stop sharing your screen and um, let me get the right list here. Um, Sebastian is uh, the speaker of the next paper. As far yeah. as I remember here, yeah, okay, all right.
Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, sounds okay. good. So the next paper is going to be one together, no need to chatter. And the presenter is going to be Sebastian Bouchard. And I'll leave him with the talk now. Yeah, thank you, Andrea, for the introduction. Um, my co are so Johan Yudoni and uh, Angel Bells. Um, the word gather refers to the distributed task known as uh, gathering. It involves mobile agents. I'm uh, shortly going to uh, describe those uh, mobile agents and the, the task of gathering. Mobile Sebastian, agents are uh, theoretical. If you could turn on your video, I think that helps a little bit if possible. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, okay. I'll try. If, it's, if it doesn't work, don't worry about it. Um, it doesn't seem to It's okay, work. just, just um, want you to talk. sorry, <laughs> I tried to turn it on, but it, okay. Um, uh, I, I'm sorry. Okay, That's okay. Uh, yeah, um, theoretical entities able to um, um, compute, execute an algorithm, observe their, own, uh, their environment and, and move in it. Here we consider um, finite and directed uh, graphs. And in, uh, in such uh, environments, the mobile agents move from one node to another one uh, following the edges. Um, I just told you that the agents observe our surroundings, that is the node where they are currently. Uh, they can see the local uh, port numbers um, at these nodes. Uh, time is discretized into an infinite sequence of rounds, and at each round, each mobile agent uh, chooses one local port number and traverses the corresponding edge. Um, and so on. Uh, we assume that uh, the agents have an unbounded memory. They are able to uh, use the um, previous observations and computations in order to um, make the, the following choices. Um, they are not obliged to, to move. They can also choose to wait uh, at each round uh, and so on. Um, and important thing is that we're interested in deterministic algorithms and uh, this determinism um, is sort of a problem. Uh, it has to be uh, considered in the model uh, because of the determinism um, in symmetry graphs, uh, two agents would be unable to, to meet. Uh, the algorithm would make the same choices for them and they would keep at the, yeah, the distance between them will never decrease. That's why in um, the articles of the line of work on which we, we build, the agents are assumed to have uh, distinct identifiers, um, simply uh, positive integers, uh, here represented in the blue colors. And uh, what we want is achieving gathering and its implications in bringing the agents uh, together. Uh, to do so in the line of work on which we build, Agents are assumed to be able to exchange information uh, when they meet. They have no idea um, how many agents there are in the graph. They have no idea. Uh, they are unable to talk uh, um, with agents uh, well when they are not collocating, uh, collocate, collocated with them. Sorry, but when agents are collocated in the lines of work on which we, uh, on which we build, the agents uh, can talk, exchange, and on one one time. For, of information, and the goal is to um, yeah, gather all agents at the same location at the same time and uh, ensure termination, that is, uh, make all agents declare simultaneously that the gathering is achieved. Okay, and um, the, yeah, <laughs> this is the, the current state of the art um, algorithm for, for this task. And the, the um, yeah, the slight, slight but uh, important difference we um, we introduce um, uh, is uh, yeah no explicit communication we assume that the agents are unable to uh, communicate explicitly uh, even when collocated um, if we didn't uh, if yeah 
if this assumption were not replaced by any weaker one, uh, the agents would not be able to ensure termination. They couldn't uh, decide whether there are other agents with them, and then they could not uh, simultaneously declare that the gathering is achieved. Hence, we replace the communication assumption by a weaker one. We assume that the agents uh, know in every round how many agents are in the same node uh, as them. Um, this is a um, rather weak assumption, but uh, thanks to that, we uh, managed to provide um, data policy gathering algorithms uh, to uh, a first one, which requires that the agents initially know a polynomial upper bound on the number of nodes of a graph, and another algorithm which doesn't require any additional information. The first algorithm is uh, deterministic, uh, uh, yeah, is polynomial um, in the number of nodes of a graph and the length of the smallest label of the agents, that is um, their identifier I, I mentioned earlier. The second algorithm, uh, its complexity, uh, its complexity is less, is less interesting. It's just for feasibility. It just um, shows that. Uh, yeah, even without the initial information, you can um, you can achieve uh, gathering. Okay, and um, actually, uh, as a byproduct, um, by um, designing our um, gathering algorithms, we managed to uh, provide algorithms for gossiping. That is, um, assume all agents initially have uh, a message, and we want uh, all agents to learn all messages that is uh, gossiping. And the other task we managed to achieve as a byproduct is leader election, uh, uh, which simply uh, asks for one uh, agent to, to be elected and uh, it's label to be known by uh, all agents. And uh, that's probably, that's, yeah, probably the most surprising um, part of our result. Uh, even without explicit communication, if the agent Students are able to read counters at uh, their nodes. They are able to uh, exchange uh, information. Uh, they are able to solve gossiping, um, learn all the messages of all of their agents. Okay, the, the main open problem here is um, to provide a um, polynomial algorithm for the case when the agents have no um, initial information. Okay, uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you. Um, questions? Okay, there's an additional comment from the previous talk. Um, any questions? Um, I have a question, a quick one. So when they don't have any initial information, yeah. how can they figure out that they have all gathered at a node? I mean, if they don't know N or have any idea of N, how can they know if all of them are at the node? even if they can know the number of, of agents at the node? Um, if you have no initial information, um, uh, the idea is um, at some point to have um, uh, a group of agents uh, gathered and uh, that the algorithm ensures that all other agents are uh, waiting in the graph, they may not be with uh, the group, but they are waiting. And the, the group, um, which um, may think that uh, they are all gathered, is going to visit the graph and um, yeah, pick uh, the, other, the other agents. And um, thanks to the fact that uh, all of us uh, had to be waiting, um, we have the property that, um, yeah, um, in the end, they're all gathered and, and know that. So the group moves together, is that what you're saying? Yeah, uh, the group uh, is going to gather the others. Okay, all right. Other questions? Um, okay, so I thank the speaker again, Stefan, and if you can stop sharing your screen so that the next speaker can come in, and that's going to be Ali. Um,
Ali, are you there? Uh, yeah, Ali's here. Ali, can you start sharing your screen? And oh, yes, I'm trying to share. Okay, sorry. Uh, sure, I'm not able to share the screen. Okay, let me. Uh, when I when I click on the share, not nothing pop up. No, it says all participants can share. Um, so the sharing rights are correct. We can start sharing. Nobody's sharing. So. Um, yeah, Ali, can you see the share screen button? Yeah, on at the bottom. Yes. Yeah, and when I click on the share, uh, I don't see my desktop. Oh, you don't see a desktop? Oh, that I don't know. Do you see the individual applications? Like whiteboard and stuff like that? Nothing. So, so you have to click on the, on the share button, not on the arrow next to it, okay? There is this kind of... Uh, when you click there, you don't see? uh there there is a page they, they there's a some a strange sign on desktop they, it says desktop one and some strange yeah just do desktop one that's that should work i think i hope i'm not giving okay. this yeah desktop one should be the right one if you click on it you should start sharing Avery is saying, check behind the Zoom window. I don't know exactly what that means. Yes, yeah, I could. Okay, I think you started, yeah. Yes. Good. So the next paper is gonna be tight analysis of asynchronous rumor spreading dynamic networks. And Ali Purmiri um, is gonna be presenting the talk. Uh, thank you, thank you. Andrea, this is a joint work with Bernard Mans from Macquarie University. Uh, let us first define our main objective, which is asynchronous rumor spreading. Uh, assume that we are at time zero and we are given a network so that every node has some Poisson clock of rate one and a node knows some piece of information, so called the rumor. So at any time a clock rings, for example, let's say at time delta one, clock rings and the node knows the rumor, sends the rumor to a random neighbor. So at time delta one, we have another informed guy and the process continues. And we are interested to see what is the spread time of the protocol, which is the first time when everybody gets informed. And we know that the, uh, for the simple and connected network, spread time is bounded by n log n, where n is the number of nodes in the graph. So here in this, uh, in this presentation, we are focusing on a dynamic evolving network, which is a kind of network that uh, the edge set may change, but the vertex set are the same. So the only restriction we have here is that uh, the vertex set doesn't change, but the edge change over time. So for example, here at time zero, we have G zero, and at time two, we have G two and et cetera. And again, we are interested in the spread time of the algorithm in dynamic graph. So maybe the first, uh, perhaps the natural idea is to reuse the result from the synchronous algorithm because the synchronous one is very wide uh, studied and there are a large volume of the paper on the synchronous. And, and there's also an, a recent result that says that if we are given a, a static graph, 
then the synchronous and asynchronous algorithms are related by, by this relation. For example, the asynchronous split time is always bounded by a synchronous one plus a lag factor. But the bad news is, is that in the dynamic setting, we don't have such a relation. And also, there, there are dichotomies between the split time of the asynchronous and synchronous algorithm. So at first, we show that uh, we can not only we cannot use the result from the synchronous and dynamic setting, also there are dichotomies. For example, here uh, we build some dynamic settings so that, for example, the synchronous algorithm needs linear number of runs to inform all nodes, while the asynchronous algorithm just only logarithmic number. And also on the other hand, we have another uh, dynamic setting where this the synchronous algorithm is very fast, but the asynchronous one is very uh, slow and need n log n time to inform everybody. Our, our next result is the tight bound for the um, for the split time, which is in the form of the, for example, we are given a, a dynamic setting denoted by uh, G, and the graph comes over time, but we show that the the, up, uh, the spirit time is bounded by this quantity, uh, which is the summation, which is the first time where the summation of the conduct dance times the network diligence is, exists, <coughs> exceeds uh, C log N, where here the fee is a, a famous conduct dance and rho is a, a new notion. Uh, the, Rho is a new uh, notion we defined for the tight analysis, which we call it the quality of the cut, and it is a diligence of cut, and it is defined so that uh, for a single edge in a cut, we can define a number, which is a D bar over DU, and a D bar over DV, where D bar is a average degree of nodes and the S. And the, the diligence of a graph G is defined as the row of S over minimizing over all S. So, and, and we say that our analysis is tight so that for every given row and phi, we can uh, generate dynamic settings so that uh, the spread time achieve this upper bound. So if, if, we, if we play with this uh, parameter rho and phi, also we could uh, get a general bound for uh, a split time, which is n square, and also there exists dynamic settings such that uh, we could get this bound. And as a uh, take home message is that uh, for the dynamic setting, uh, network diligence is as important as network conductance. And also this as asynchronous and synchronous rumor estimating cannot be well estimated from each other in dynamic setting. Thanks for your attention. If you have any question, happy to answer. Okay, thank you, Ali. Any questions? Um, I have a quick one. So your asynchronous time in some prior slide was giving us something better than the worst case synchronous time, correct? Uh, here you mean yeah so it, it well if it was like a completely a synchronous model where things could be active concurrently synchronous would be a special case of asynchronous so you're assuming a sequential type of model for asynchronous here like where nodes are activated uh, one at a time according to the Poisson clocks no no they they can they can they can work together. It's, it's not, mm. they are not sequential. Okay, so I'm missing something here because I can't see how asynchronous could be better than synchronous because if everybody woke up at the same time, unlikely, I get it, but is this a worst case type of bound or expected with high probability? No, no it's, a, it's, a, it's, a I, it's a worst case. It's a worst case. Worst case. For yeah. asynchronous and, the, and, and the problem is that in the asynchronous model, maybe we, sometimes we have a delay because the, the time is the exponential time, and maybe sometimes it takes more than one unit of time and sometimes less. So that's yeah. why it depends on the setting, yes. So how are you counting time in asynchronous then? Just uh, asynchronous? 
it's it's a just summation of uh, some uh, exponential random variable. Okay, but not in terms of rounds or anything like that. No, no, maybe no, maybe it's better if I on. just have a look at the paper. I think that would be better to understand yeah. this better. Yeah. Sure. Any other any other questions? All right. So Ali, if you can stop sharing your screen, and if a question comes in, I'll still ask you so that the next speaker, who's going to be um, Thomas, um, can start sharing his screen. That would be great. You can start. So the next talk is going to be energy complexity of breadth first search in radio networks, and Thomas Hayes is going to be presenting. Thomas, you're muted. We're not hearing you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, you should start from the previous slide if you're saying something. Yes, this is um, joint work with my co-authors. Um, and let me start. So uh, imagine a sensor network um, which has been deployed in a forest um, and they detect a fire and they want to get the word out. So each one broadcasts a little message to the nearby sensors and this propagates um, until everyone knows. So um, we want to address the energy complexity of this kind of um, setting. So, um, um, so, so we had an arbitrary but unknown graph topology because these um, sensors have been placed randomly um, and we want to conserve battery life. So um, the, the, the first thing which is important is that in our setting, we consider um, a cost, a unit cost for each send and a unit cost for each listen, because um, as the size of these units shrinks, the, the cost of, um, of listening, using your transceiver to, to receive, um, becomes comparable to the cost of using it to broadcast. Um, so we want to look at algorithms which adaptively power off the receiver and try to only turn it on at just the right time when a message is going to come. And what we can see is that, say, if, if I show the naive broadcast protocol, and I, in this example, I have a linear topology, um, the green means listening, red means sending, um, my cost is going to be linear because um, nobody can show off until after they've received the message. Um, so um, each node will only need to send once, but we'll need to listen. Um, diameter number of steps, which can be n, the number of nodes. And um, so we get a linear energy cost. Now, when we're allowed to power down our transceiver, we can improve this um, if we know the distances of each node from the start. So the idea is we're going to use distance information to get nodes to wake up at just the right time to listen and receive a message. And we see that if each node wakes up at step i, where i is its distance, receives a message, sends a message in step i plus one, then our total energy cost drops from linear down to constant. And um, that is the point of this model. We want to improve our algorithms so that we can um, reduce the number of times time steps spent listening for messages. Okay. And um, okay, so. Um, technically, there's a possibility of collisions because if, um, if more than one um, person next to you transmits at the same time, those signals might collide. You'll, you, you can't receive all of them. Um, the other thing um, is that we're going for, um, for poly n time, and we're willing to trade off latency versus energy cost to some extent, but we want only polylog energy cost. Um, our main result in this paper is we, we consider trying to solve the breadth for a search problem, but that's just one example of a problem that we'd like to be able to save energy on in this model. Um, um, we're able to achieve a subpolynomial 
energy. Um, and technically it's this horrible function. It's a little worse than polylog, um, but, um, but much better than um, a previous algorithms. So, so I, I don't think there was a published algorithm before this that was able to achieve sublinear, sublinear energy to solve breadth first search. And uh, here's just a uh, one slide sketch of our algorithm. So, so, so I have some original graphs, I just did a square grid. Um, there's some red node there who knows it's the root. And um, all the other nodes, um, nobody knows where they are, but they want to calculate the distance to the root. So the first step is to form nodes into clusters and then let, okay, so two clusters are adjacent if they, they contain adjacent nodes. And um, these clusters, um, so recursively, um, they have solved BFS. Um, and the idea is um, within the cluster graph where nodes are clusters and um, edges are um, our two clusters next to each other. If we find distances within that graph, then the idea is that um, nodes, so if you run the naive BFS algorithm, um, nodes can only sleep if they somehow know that they're distant from the frontier. And the idea is that um, since we've solved distances in the cluster graph, all the nodes that, whose cluster is far, those must also be far. And this works as long as the distances in the cluster graph are an accurate proxy for distances in, in the underlying graph. And it turns out that if you um, construct these clusters in the right way, um, and this uses a recent algorithm due to Miller, Peng, and Shu, um, then, uh, then you have this property. And um, it, uh, if, if we bootstrap it properly, then you can actually get down to sublinear energy costs. If you, so if you use uh, one layer of clusters, then, um, then you can get uh, a quadratic speed up. Uh, a quadratic energy savings is actually some, some sort of slowdown in the time. And um, that's it. Thank you. Um, question, a quick question. Um, we are trying to catch up with the schedule here. I mean, not delay any further. So quick question. Um, then a quick question for me, Thomas. Do you, you said you did this for BFS, but you have other algorithms maybe in mind. Do you have anything in mind or just going to look at other problems that you can apply a similar energy saving type of algorithm? Well, yeah, so, um, so uh, we, we have a previous paper in which we solved the broadcast problem, so, so one to so, all. Thomas, I'm going to interrupt you just for one second. If you can stop sharing your screen and the next speaker can start sharing while you answer, that would be the best. Sorry um, for that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, so, so other questions. Um, well, we've been working a bit on matchings and colorings um, um, and some um, some like uh, election um, protocols, um, consensus majority, um, independent sets. Um, okay. So a lot of other stuff. Yeah, really, this is just a first step, and okay. and the, to some level, the the main uh, the main new contribution is this model and and the fact that it's not trivial. That's very nice. I think Amitabh left some question also for you on the chat. If you can answer through the chat, I'm going to move on here just for the sake of time. That's okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. All right. So the next talk is going to be a brief announcement, improved distributed approximation for maximum weight independent set. And uh, Seri Kuri, and I hope I'm saying this name correctly, is going to be the presenter. And I'll, I'll let you start your talk. Thank you, uh, Andrea, and hello, everyone. I'm going to talk about an approximation for maximum weight independent set. This is joint work with Kenichi Korabayachi, Aaron Schild, and Gregor Schwartzman. So in this work, we consider the well-known congest model in which we have a synchronized communication network of n nodes. We have a node of log n bit size messages, and the goal is to compute some function of the network while minimizing the number of communication rounds. And specifically, we consider the problem of approximating the maximum weight independent set in the congest model. 
So there is a very simple folklore ranking algorithm that gives an expected delta approximation in just a single round, where delta is the maximum degree of fraud in the graph. And there is a work by Bopana, Halderson, and Dravitz in which they, they show a slightly better approximation guarantee, also an expectation. If someone is interested in approximation guarantee that's not only an expectation, then there is a work by Barry Huda, Tenzur Hillel, Kafari, and Schwarzman, in which they show that the delta approximation can be achieved in O of MIS log W rounds, where MIS is the complexity of finding a maximal independent set, and W is the maximum weight of an old graph. Recall that the maximal independent set is not necessarily a maximum independent set or a maximum weight independent set. And this term translates to something like log n times log delta or something like that. In this work, we show that by paying one plus epsilon factor in the approximation guarantee, we can get an exponential speed up compared to Barry Huda et al. And if delta is at most n over log n, then we can get this result in O of 1 over epsilon rounds. But unfortunately, we can't, get this, we can't get this result for any value of delta, as we can show a lower bound. And all I'm going to tell you about in the remaining one and a half minutes is our starting point that was an O of delta approximation in polylog log n rounds for the unweighted case. So let me denote by g the input graph of the congest model by v the set of nodes and e the set of edges. And the first observation to make in unweighted graphs is that any maximal independent set contains at least n over delta nodes. So by just finding a maximal independent set, one can find the delta approximation to maximum independent set in unweighted graphs. And what is the time complexity of finding a maximal independent set? So it's O of log delta plus polylog log n rounds. So if delta was small, let's say it was at most log n or polylog n, then we would be done because this would be polylog log n. But unfortunately, delta can be as large as n. So the main idea is to sparsify the graph and to find the maximal independent set in a sparse subgraph H. And in order for this idea to work, we need this subgraph H to have the following properties. First, delta H, the maximum degree in H is small, say O of log n. And second, the ratio between the number of nodes in H, the maximum degree in H is at least S in G, or at least not very far from it. So once we find such a subgraph H, we can find the maximal independent set in H, which takes only polylog log n rounds, and this is because delta H is O of log n. And it returns an independent set that is O of delta approximation to maximum independent set in the original input graph G. And it turns out that there is some simple sampling procedure that you can use to find such a subgraph H. And this idea can be also extended to weighted graphs. Unfortunately, I don't have much time to talk about weighted graphs, but if you are uh, interested, please feel free to contact me or any of the authors. Let me conclude with these three points. First, we find it very interesting that the one plus epsilon delta approximation can be found uh, exponentially faster than finding a maximal independent set. And this is because a maximal independent set has this lower bound. Second, we want to propose an open question, which is regarding the complexity of finding an O of delta uh, approximation deterministically. And third, observe that delta can be very large. It can be as large as n. So a natural question is, what happens with constant approximations? And it turns out that there are constants for which you need to spend at least linear number of rounds or even quadratic number of rounds. And for this, I want to refer to a talk by Yuval Efron as part of the POTSI program. And if I'm not mistaken, it's the last talk in the program. And I strongly encourage you to attend this talk. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Um, super quick question we can handle. Yeah, there is one here by that says what techniques you use for the lower bound. Um, oh, if it's a quick it's, answer, that's great. Otherwise, I'll suggest that you guys continue a, following up on Zulipor. Okay, it's a quick uh, answer. So, observe. Okay, so. Oh, so I, I said, can, can you? Oh, if you need your slides, then go on. Otherwise, I was going to ask you to stop sharing yeah, yeah. so that the next speaker starts. Okay, so I just want to say that. Okay, so the idea of the lower bound is to do a, a reduction to an OR's lower bound for maximal independence set on a cycle. But first, observe that we have an upper bound for low degree graphs, and the cycle is a low degree graph. So, the cycle is not the hard instance for this lower bound. However, we show that if you can find a delta uh, approximation in a cycle of clicks, and please contact me if you need more details, then you can find the maximal independent set on a cycle. And the idea is that if you can find an O of delta uh, approximation on a cycle of clicks, then this independent set doesn't have large gaps. And therefore, you can move back to the cycle and find the maximal independent set by filling in these gaps. So, and this, this gives the omega of log star and lower bound. All right. Maybe can follow up on the chat later on, Sari. Um, if you stop sharing, oh, yeah, that's great. Next speaker is Heming Chen. So yeah, good, he's there. So the next talk is gonna be another brief announcement, competitive broadcast against adaptive adversary multi-channel radio networks. 
and Hamin Chen is going to be presenting. Hemi, you're muted. We're not hearing you. I'll unmute you here. Why is it not, not working? Uh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, okay. now it's good. Now we can hear you. Uh, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Hemi Chen. I'll talk about competitive broadcast against the WL3. In multi channel video networks. This joint work with my advisor, Chao Dong Zheng. We consider single hop network with N nodes and they commit over shared medium containing C channels. Time is divided into synchronous runs, also called slots. At each slot, each node either send on a channel or listen on a channel or remain idling. On listening nodes, we'll get feedback. In a single channel setting, in other words, C is one, the feedback is determined by the number of sending nodes. We here assume there is collision detection. So if no no send, the feedback will be silence. While at least two no send, the feedback will be noise. Um, back to the multi-channel setting, since there is no interference among channels, so for each channel, its status depend on the, num the number of nodes sending on the channel. And only nodes listening on the channel will receive status as their feedback. Here is an example of two channels. And the first way called Eve, also participates as cushion by jamming. As long as the channel is jammed by Eve, the nodes listened on the channel will hear noise. For example, in thanks slot, Eve jammed channel two, and the pink node on channel two will receive noise. And while the green node on channel one still re receives the message. Each slot, Eve can jam any set of channels. For example, jam all channels in the third slot. Here it is that, that if it's adaptable, uh, so she's given all past execution history to decide the channels to jam in current slot. We focus on energy complexity. For each node, sending or listening for one slot cost one little energy. And for Eve, jamming one channel for one time slot cost one. In resource competitive analysis, the only restriction of Eve is the total amount of jamming. So the budget is denoted as capital T, which is all node to nodes. We seek an algorithm that the maximum cost of any single node is at the most some function rho of t plus some term tau. Here rho is a function of t, which captures additional cost due to jamming. And our main goal is to minimize the function rho. The problem we focus on is broadcast, in which a source node wants to submit a message to all the other nodes. Here I give a randomized algorithm and also law bound showing the algorithm cost is optimal up to point log factors. Last year, we showed having multiple channels available allows the linear speed up in the runtime with the energy cost unchanged. But we also require C should be big O of N and E should be oblivious. In this work, we remove the two restrictions. Um, our algorithm works for arbitrary NC values and can tolerate an adaptive adversary. Um, we use a optimal forecast with proper working probabilities and in analysis, we cap the real execution with other carefully crafted processes. Here is an overview of technique. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any one quick question? Otherwise, we're running a bit over time. We can leave any other discussions on Zulip. Um, as it's, yeah, this is very interesting work, and I guess I'll follow up on it later on. Do you have the full paper somewhere, Hemi, or not yet? Uh, so this is a brief um, announcement, right? Was this just a brief announcement, or is there a full version of the paper? Oh, it's there. Okay. All right. That's great. Thank you. All right. So, um, Yuval, um, I think I'll just conclude this session here, unless you have anything else to add. Uh, no, please uh, go ahead. Just don't forget to stop the recording. <laughs> no, I will stop right now. Um, and. Uh...